Good evening. You're watching Arirang News at 8. It's Monday, February 3rd here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I am Yuji Han. We begin this evening with inter-Korean relations. After exchanging messages back and forth on Monday, the two Koreas have agreed to hold working-level talks on the resumption of reunions for families separated by the Korean War. Our Hwang Sung-hee has more on the upcoming engagement. Breaking its week-long silence, North Korea proposed on Monday morning that the two Koreas meet for Red Cross talks on either Wednesday or Thursday to discuss resuming the long-suspended reunions for families divided by the Korean War. Shortly after, South Korea accepted the proposal, calling for talks on Wednesday at the Truce Village of Panmunjom. At the meeting, the two sides will decide when and where the reunions will take place. South Korea had previously proposed holding the event from February 17th to the 22nd at North Korea's Mount Gyeonggang Resort. But since it takes roughly two weeks to prepare for such an event, the Koreas are up against the clock. Nonetheless, Seoul's unification ministry prefers sooner rather than later. The exact date must be discussed with North Korea, the working level talks, but the South Korean government will try to have the family reunions held as soon as possible, considering the urgency of the matter. The upcoming joint military exercises between South Korea and the United States, scheduled to begin late this month, could also push back the reunions. Seoul and Washington say the annual drills involving thousands of troops are purely defensive in nature, but Pyongyang views them as a war game. Experts say the North could make a counterproposal on the reunion dates that would have the event taking place after the Key Resolve and Full Eagle exercises, which end in April, or even walk away. They will always can say they were nice, they wanted family reunions, they wanted better relations, but the South Koreans, as usual, again showed their aggressive nature. South Korea had earlier said that the reunion dates could be changed upon North Korea's request if it was for justifiable reasons. But because North Korea has a history of walking out of its agreements, the elderly family members waiting to reunite for the first time in more than six decades will likely have their fingers crossed until the day they see their loved ones again. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, the full itinerary has not been announced on U.S. President Obama's first visit to Asia this year. He's largely expected to visit Japan, the Philippines and Malaysia. With no mention of South Korea yet, the Seoul government is reportedly making efforts to have him stop over, especially with the U.S. Secretary of State making his own trip later this month. Our Kim ji reports. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is reportedly planning a visit to South Korea later this month to discuss security issues on the Korean Peninsula and ways to deal with potential provocations from North Korea. At a security forum in Munich on Saturday, Kerry announced his plans to visit China in two weeks to work on the North Korean issue. South Korean government sources say the U.S. top diplomat is likely to pay a visit to Seoul before or after his trip to Beijing. That would put Kerry in Seoul sometime during the third week of this month, right before the joint South Korea-U.S. key resolve military exercises are scheduled to start in Korea. Could his trip be followed up by a visit from U.S. President Barack Obama a couple months later? Citing U.S. and Japanese officials, the Yomiuri Shimba reports that President Obama will be making stops in Japan, the Philippines and Malaysia during a tour of the region in April. He is reportedly considering a visit to Seoul as well. Obama and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe are expected to discuss a wide range of issues, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the territorial disputes with China and Japan and the denuclearization of North Korea. President Obama had to cancel his trip to Southeast Asia in October due to the federal shutdown in the United States. Kim Ji-yeon, Arirang News. At the nation's top office, President Park Geun-hye has nominated first vice foreign minister Kim Kyu-hyun as the head of the newly revived National Security Council Secretariat. Kim, a veteran diplomat, has served as a deputy chief mission to the United States and a deputy foreign minister. The presidential office of Chong Ade says his leadership as well as his negotiation and crisis management skills were the main reasons behind the president's decision. The NSC secretariat was shut down by the Lee Myung-bak administration back in 2000. 
2008. President Park ordered that it be reestablished in December in consideration of the growing threats from North Korea and escalating tensions in Northeast Asia. And over now to a high-profile treason trial. Prosecutors have sought 20-year prison term for a leftist lawmaker accused of plotting to overthrow his own government. The verdict on 52-year-old Lee Seok Gi is expected in two weeks' time. Park Ji Won has this report. At the Suwon District Court on Monday, prosecutors requested a 20-year prison term for left-wing lawmaker Lee Seok Gi. Who stands accused of conspiring to stage a revolt in the event of an inner Korean war? Prosecutors also demanded that the 52-year-old lawmaker be stripped of his voting rights and be restricted from holding public office for 10 years after his release from prison. Prosecutors say the severe punishment befits the crime, as Lee had previously been arrested and prosecuted for a similar offense back in 2002. They added that Lee has shown no remorse for his actions and that he attempted to destroy the basic democratic order of South Korea in violation of constitutional law. Lee is currently standing trial on charges of leading a pro-North Korea group called the Revolutionary Organization. The underground group was allegedly plotting to overthrow the government by plotting to sabotage the South Korean government and U.S. troops in the event of an inner Korean war. In addition to Lee, prosecutors are seeking 10 to 15 year prison terms for six other unified Progressive Party members who were indicted on the same charges. Lee has consistently denied the insurrection charges against them. A final verdict in his trial is scheduled to come by the 17th of this month at the latest. Observers say the ruling is likely to greatly influence the Constitutional Court's ruling on whether the leftist unified progressive party should be disbanded. The National Assembly is also currently reviewing a motion that calls for Lee seok to be removed from his parliamentary seat. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. While the U.S. state of Virginia is inching closer to passing a bill calling for the use of both the EC and the Sea of Japan in school textbooks, Japan is engaging in a meticulous scheme to stop the plan, going so far as to hire a lobbying firm to pile the pressure on Virginia. UDN has more on Japan's nationalistic campaign. This is a service contract between McGuire Woods, one of the biggest lobbying firms in the United States, and the Japanese embassy in the U.S. The contract contains various ways to stop Virginia's General Assembly from passing a bill that would allow textbooks to note the Sea of Japan is also called EC. The bill, which was passed last Thursday, is important to the large Korean-American community in Virginia, who see the current sole designation of the body of water between Korea and Japan as Sea of Japan as a painful relic of Japanese occupation back in the first half of the 20th century. The contract includes ways to explain why calling the body of water EC is wrong and also plan to form protests against the Korean-American community calling for the adoption of the new title. The contract also included ways to make the new governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, veto the bill if it did pass the full house. The documents actually revealed that Japan's ambassador Kenichiro Sasae had already sent a letter to McAuliffe in December threatening that economic ties between Japan and Virginia will be damaged if the bill was enacted. It's highly unusual for a foreign embassy to be actively involved in a local state's legislation, so the findings are expected to cause quite a stir. Despite the Japanese embassy's efforts that cost them 75,000 U.S. dollars over the span of three months, the bill was passed last week by a House Education Subcommittee, and it now heads to the full House Education Committee. Chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia, Pat Mullen, says his party supports the bill, adding that all students in Virginia should have a thorough understanding of problems in the world. Yurian, Arirang News. 
For more on this dual name designation bill, which is in the middle of a long standing dispute between Korea and Japan, we go one on one with Dr. Hong Sung Pil, professor of law at Yonsei University. Now, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, how are you? All right, so all the bill would do is to require mm -hmm. future Virginia textbooks to note that the Sea of Japan is also known as a sea. What is the significance of this case that has pushed Japan to go as far as warning mm -hmm. Washington that it would harm the trading uh, relations with Tokyo? I think, um, most of all, it presents the high level of embarrassment or frustration now, that now Japan feels about how the United States and the people in the United States are taking this overall the Second World War issue and also the Korea and Japan and Asia regional affairs as well. Um, I think two possibilities. Uh, Japanese Prime Minister you know, Shinzo Abe had the wrong, possibly had the wrong idea of getting away rather easily with the uh, recent visit to the Yasukuni and flatly denying the responsibility of the Second World War without taking further responsibility. Mm -hmm. Or he had he and his administration had a very strong determination to pursue sort of right-wing stance in international sins. And I think it, all those things have come as a sort of side effect that have been going on in, by Japan in, uh, in, as to the lobbying in the United States. Mm. Well, speaking of lobbying, Korea does not have the same economic weight to throw yeah. around in Virginia compared to Japan, which is the second biggest investor there. But we know for mm -hmm. sure is that Korea has a large and politically motivated uh, mm -hmm. community there that has helped a great deal yeah. um, to win that passage of the bill. Like, can you elaborate to us? Well, your role? Um, personally, I'm very happy and um, I'm gratified to note that um, now the Korea has you know, reached that level of development. So development to me, uh, democracy and also economy mm. have uh, sort of has a spillover effect into the Korean American community as well. And uh, now the Korean communi American community itself has reached the level of maturity to feel that um, that political participation should be part of their living in the United States. So now it has you know, reached the level of maturity in terms of uh, localization and in terms of internationalization as well. Now it has more links to Armenian or the Jewish community in the United States and how to, they now know how to cooperate with them. And also they, they seem to um, feel the stronger need to make contributions to international cause. Mm -hmm. And well, at the bottom it is also, you know, it has a lot to do with the uh, specific Korean sense of just strong sense of justice as well. Mm, sure it is. Uh, will the governor of the state of Virginia eventually sign the bill uh, despite growing pressure from Japan? Well, uh, it's, it's simply a mapping issue. It's, it's a naming issue as well. And, and uh, so and, uh, it, it was sort of considered as sort of parochial bill rather than a very significant one. Now it has become a center of political debate in the state of you know, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so I think he's, uh, he must be placed under tremendous level of political pressure. Now he openly said that uh, if he, the bill comes to his table, he has to sign it. But he's, it is also his responsibility to make everyone happy. So, but uh, I think you know, it would be very difficult for him to flatly deny mm. and refuse to sign the bill. Okay. Well, looking at an overall perspective, the Japanese leadership is under fire for its handling of history and its denial of its war atrocities. Do you think they will eventually come to terms and admit their mistakes and make you know, real mm -hmm. efforts to improve bilateral ties? Well, we've been recently covering a lot of times about Japanese advancement yes, in this area. Have. And uh, at for, t for a while, I think uh, 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 Shinzo Abe's administration would continue to keep mm -hmm. this stance because it has a lot of issues to take deal with, first, uh, economic prosperity, and second, it has to find ways how to cope with the challenges from China. Mm -hmm. And also, I think uh, Japanese media and the public opinion are very strongly still tied to the uh, political propaganda or political maneuveration of the uh, Japanese political elites. And it, you know, after all, it, it comes up, it, it has also to do with, a lot to do with the uh, democracy in, the, in Japan as well. Mm -hmm. So th at this point, uh, we are seeing a very strange feature of a Japanese version of democracy. And well, now uh, China is you know, uh, taking ever the stronger position on this issue. Now, China has established An Jung and the Korean independence movement leader, his, his memorial, and also now China is trying to Take, take of issues of uh, 731 regiment case or Nanjing massacre more, uh, more seriously. And United States, um, also it has uh, a lot 
two um, important issues in this area, but it does not really have a very conclusive answer or position regarding you know, whether this, this region should go. And so, and, um, and the Korea, we, the, the country of Korea, this country is well, in a, definitely in a position to respond to properly to all the public provocative actions from coming from Japan and from other countries as well. So nobody has the key and, uh, and unless, unless Japan stops and it changes at one time and then we, but uh, one uh, short hope is that you know, Obama, President Obama is supposedly coming to Asia mm -hmm. and uh, John Kerry is coming this month to Korea. So I think for the next two months, I really hope we can find an answer to these questions for very easily. Certainly we will. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hong, for coming in today. My pleasure. That very visit. Touch base with journalists, experts, and analysts who are taking the pulse of Asia's heartbeat. South Korea's defense minister. In a lively half hour, join Arirang's Yu Ji Hae for the day's top stories, current affairs, business, technology trends, plus global weather forecasts, and more. Arirang News. Every weeknight, live on Arirang TV. With four months to go until the first local elections during the Park Geun Hye administration, the National Assembly began a month-long extraordinary session this Monday. Our Kim Hyun Ji says it appears likely to be marked by more political wrangling between the two parties, not just on the election front, but on the legislative front as well. The pre-registration of candidates for the June 4th local elections begins this Tuesday. And when the bell rings, the rival parties will start their four-month-long race to the line. Preliminary candidate registration will continue until May 14th. And those who choose to register during this period are allowed to start campaigning ahead of the main candidate registration in mid-May. The June elections cover 17 provincial governor and mayoral seats, as well as education superintendents and local assembly members. The ruling Sinori Party and the main opposition Democratic Party are quickening steps to name candidates for the nationwide polls, and they plan to finalize their nominations by April. Independent lawmaker Anter Su is also aiming to launch his own party by March and field candidates for all 17 provincial governor and mayoral seats. With the addition of Ahn's party, the June local elections are expected to be a three-way race for the first time in 16 years. Ahead of the elections, the rival parties are expected to lock horns on a range of issues in Parliament this month. Lawmakers will launch a probe into the massive personal data leak last month involving three credit card companies. But the rival parties are wide apart on how to handle the crisis. The ruling Senate Party is focusing on penalizing financial institutions by imposing fines on them if they are found to have leaked their customers' personal data. But the main opposition Democratic Party wants to adopt a compensation system focusing more on having financial institutions pay for the damage incurred by data losses. The Democratic Party is also demanding Finance Minister Hyun Oh-suk, as well as the heads of the nation's financial regulators, step down to take responsibility for the data leak. But the Senate Party says handling the crisis must be their top priority. The rival parties are also locking horns over the government's basic old-age pension plan, with the opposition party adamant about sticking to President Park's original pledge to pay all senior citizens 200,000 won, or about 185 U.S. dollars, every month. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. Ahead of the summer months, which are considered the peak time for travel in Korea, the government unveiled a second batch of tourism promotion measures on Monday. From introducing alternative holiday systems at workplaces to developing various tourism programs, our presidential office correspondent Oh Jin-ju has the details. If the government's first set of tours and promotion measures in July was focused on bringing foreign tourists to Korea, its second batch of measures unveiled Monday is aimed at enhancing domestic tourism. The government laid out its plans in a meeting presided over by President Park Geun-hye on Monday. One part of the plan involves the establishment of so-called tourism weeks in spring and fall to more evenly distribute the nation's tourism demand, which currently peaks in the summer.
The designation will cover a total of 22 days, from May 1st to the 11th and September 25th to October 5th. The Tourism Ministry and the Education Ministry are considering whether to close elementary, middle, and high schools for short vacations during these periods. Also starting this year, the government will select three tour cities of the year. Each of the three cities will be provided with as much as $2.3 million over a three-year period. President Peck described tourism as a goose that lays golden eggs and pledged to include tourism as the key sector in her three-year plan for economic innovation. She called for world-class policies that are in line with the public's rising standards and those that bring out the unique characteristics of each region. Koreans spend around $23 billion a year on domestic tourism, triggering more than $36 billion in production and creating some 5 million jobs. President Park emphasized that should domestic tourism increase by 10 percent above that, the effect would be enormous. The president was joined at Monday's meeting by the Secretary General of the UN World Tourism Organization, Talev Rafai, who emphasized Korea's role in creating new opportunities for developing nations through tourism. President Beck also highlighted the importance of nurturing students in vocational high schools for the tourism industry, benchmarking Switzerland's advanced vocational training system, saying it will raise the nation's youth employment level and help meet the demands for employees in the sector. Oh Jin Chu, Adrang News. And in the wake of Korea's largest ever personal information leak, financial regulators have slapped three-month business suspensions under credit card companies under question. This comes as the government tries to bolster efforts to better secure the public's personal and financial information. Akani Kim reports. Korea's financial regulators are coming down hard on three credit card companies whose customer data was stolen in the largest personal information leak in the country's history. The Financial Services Commission and the Financial Supervisory Service will suspend the business operations of KB Kumin Card, NH Nongyap Card, and Lotte Card for three months, starting February 17. Under the terms of the suspension, the companies will be banned from taking on new customers, issuing card loans, or processing cash advances. Existing customers, however, will not be affected as the suspension does not ban the firms from providing financial services to them. The suspension is the first in over 10 years when credit card companies indiscriminately issued credit cards that led to mounting individual debt. Last month's leak, which affected at least 20 million people, sparked concerns the data could have ended up in the hands of scammers. The estimated compensation for mental damage caused to customers by the data breach is expected to reach nearly 160 million U.S. dollars. As another part of the punishment, the CEOs of the three firms are to face punishment depending on their accountability. With the public still up in arms over the leak, Prime Minister Chong Won said Sunday that law enforcement authorities will begin an indefinite crackdown on those who illegally circulate or use leaked personal data. However, concern continues to rise as it turns out not only credit card holders' information could be at risk. Following an external audit, the Financial Supervisory Service confirmed Monday that the data of 51 customers of the Prudential Life Insurance Company of Korea has also been leaked. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The Korean currency fell by the most in more than seven months against the U.S. dollar on this Monday as the U.S. Federal Reserve's quantitative easing sparked concerns about capital outflows from emerging markets. The Korean won shed more than 14 won to finish the day at 1,084 won against the greenback. The analysts in Seoul are saying that while the dollar gained ground aided by the Fed's stimulus cut and emerging market jitters, the Korean won weakened as foreign investors unloaded stocks. And meanwhile, shares in Seoul also finished the trading session lower in response to further Fed stimulus cuts and soft Chinese economic surveys. The benchmark KOSPI closed down 1.1 percent at 1920, while the tech-heavy KOSDAQ dropped 0.3 percent. Let's go over to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center for a checkup. The Bogyang this week got off to a bitterly cold start here in Seoul. Are we in for another dip tomorrow? 
Yes, Tia, and the cold will continue through Thursday. In fact, cold wave advisories have been issued throughout the country with the exception of Seoul and some of the West Coast regions. Currently, we are under the influence of a high pressure system, which is why we're seeing clear skies across the map. Well, tomorrow is Ipchun, which is one of the 24 indicators marking the beginning of spring. However, the weather looks to be a frigid one, so please make sure to bundle up. Also, there is a possibility that snow may fall in the Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul makes it to minus 5 degrees, while Gwangju and Busan hit minus 1 and 3 degrees, respectively. Moving on, Teju makes it to 2 degrees, and Dokdo tops out at minus 2. Well, that's all for now, and back to you, Tihe. Thanks, Bogyoung. And that's a broadcast on this Monday evening. I'm Yu Jihae in Seoul. Thanks for watching.